to another episode of Business with Passion. Each show features guests who have transformed their long-term passion into a successful business. I'm your host, Jay Hamilton Roth. My marketing strategy business grew from my love of talking with passionate business owners. In this series, I share their passion with you. So if you're looking for inspiration to enhance your business passion, keep watching. Well, Maker Faire is a place to discover new things and, and new people that are making things. Uh, so I, I think it's just this, this creative collection of projects and people that you don't see every day because they're working in their garages and their basements and they've got ideas in their head and they're trying to make them real. And Maker Faire is a place to say, I think I can share it with other people now. I think I'm a creative person and I, I, I like putting things together that and other people don't think belong. I, uh, it's not necessarily logical or rational to do that. Uh, you say, oh, that's interesting, and that's interesting, and, and it sort of fits. And I, I think the thread for me is, is uh, one is, is enthusiasm. I, I, I think I have a little of it myself, and I, I look for it in other people, and it, it, it's what I believe, it's what I trust. And so I, I've, this Maker Fair is a collection of enthusiasts, and they each have different um, ways of expressing that enthusiasm, different projects, but they, they come from the same place, if you know what I mean. And that's what uh, the discovery of those people and their projects and, and organizing them together seems to be what I'm about. My background has been in writing and uh, a desire to create with words and things. And I think Make Magazine is, is, is a culmination of things, something that uh, is actually a beautiful package of lots of stories written by uh, our community. Uh, but uh, what I, I like that makes it different from a lot of magazines is the how-to magazine. It tells you how to do things yourself. It's not just about other people doing cool things. We want you to do them. And so it's a book of recipes, uh, but unusual ones. It's un, un, uh, things that we, today we often don't know what the recipe behind something is, like an iPod. You know, you know what, how did they make that? So we're breaking that stuff down and figuring out how to do it ourselves. My job in some ways is about ideas. Uh, and uh, really, uh, it's the same journey that our makers. You imagine something that ought to be, and you try to figure out if you can do it yourself. And what resources do you need? What time does it take? And uh, Maker Faire just began as a really simple idea that I thought these people, first of all, would enjoy meeting each other. I thought other people would enjoy meeting them. So I wanted to give them a table, put their stuff on a table, and talk to people about it. It was that simple of an idea, but put a lot of different kinds of people together. And these are all kind of amateurs, they're, 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 but now they're building, in our fourth year, they're building exhibits. They're building ways to interact with people. They've gone beyond just tables. They have, uh, you know, setups that, you know, you'd think were professional, really. There's a lot of, as I said, enthusiasm, a lot of passion here for people doing things because they believe in it themselves. At the same time, they're creating a social value that they're not always aware of. So I find myself fascinated by that, um, that this is a kind of future that we're building here, a way to do things that is new um, and, and may become more and more important. Uh, it's, uh, while I don't think necessarily makers sit down to conquer economic or environmental challenges, they actually do in an indirect way. So providing the context for that is part of what I think is next, is understanding how valuable this is to our society. And one of the most valuable ways is education, that not just kids here, but all of us, literally that term lifelong learners, make is about, there's always something new to learn and isn't that great? You know, isn't it fun? Uh, it might be, seem complex and people may have told you sometime that you couldn't learn that, but you can. You know, you really can learn welding. You can learn, now you won't be someone who's done it their whole lives, but just like musicians, there are musicians who play a few songs and have a great time playing. There are people that are professional musicians and have a miserable time playing, right? So there's a broad spectrum of things to do in here. And, and I think we want to really connect kids into the maker movement. And we've done things today like an education day, bringing kids to meet makers, meet real people, creating real things. And it's very inspiring. My passion is teaching people how to build stuff, especially people who don't think that they, they can learn how to make something. I've always enjoyed building stuff myself, and I've always enjoyed working with groups and with others who build stuff. And um, 
I guess I was a bit surprised when I discovered there were some people who didn't make stuff. And I, I, I realized I enjoy teaching, and I'm told I'm a good teacher. And I realized that I really especially love teaching people who um, think that they can't make anything. I really believe that anybody can learn how to build things, how to make things with their own hands. The way I turn this into a business is primarily as teaching. I do teach at public schools and then as part of Teach Me to, Wait and to Make with my partner, we teach in, also in public schools and after school programs, um, various, uh, uh, various events for children and adults. Um, and then we discovered along the way that there were some projects that kept coming up over and over that people wanted to be able to reproduce at home. So we started by telling them these are all common objects, you can make this yourself, and people would still look at us blankly. So uh, we came up with the idea, and we're actually supported by the, the group here, the crew here at the Maker Shed, to put together a kit to allow people to build one of our projects. So the first kit we came up with is a very, very simple do-it-yourself um, robotic vehicle. And we, call it, we sort of call it a robotic vehicle in the sense that it, it doesn't, uh, it's not autonomous, it doesn't really possess a brain but it demonstrates the basics of um, locomotion, of motor control, of remote control, um, while trying to keep the prices as dirt cheap as possible. Um, there's a natural progression from that to a bigger machine with a more powerful motor, but using the same mechanisms. And then to get rid of the remote control and the human controlling it, to having a brain on board and having it being a truly autonomous robot. So for that particular line, there's a whole um, um, sequence of things that can happen uh, based on the basic concept of a ro robotic vehicle. And we do hope to get into the whole, the whole angles of teaching robotics, teaching behavior, teaches, teaching various ways to sense the surroundings and to respond accordingly. And of course, to have the, the students program the robot to do what they wish based on those stimuluses, stimuli, not necessarily what we think it a robot should do. Um, the other thing is that we really enjoy um, doing really, really simple projects. So one of our very, very popular projects is a, an LED flashlight that we base on a um, pair of clothespins. So again, clothespins really cheap, very familiar, non-threatening. LED and battery are hopefully the only components that students might have seen that they're not familiar with. And using those items, they're able to make a little flashlight out of it. Not necessarily the world's best flashlight, but that's not the point. The point is they've learned how electric circuits work. They understand how to make electrical connections. They understand how um, batteries have polarity and that LEDs have polarity. They understand uh, the difference between a good connection and a bad connection and how most things that go bad are bad because of bad connections. Uh, so there are a lot of actually basic fundamental engineering principles that come across in this really, really simple project. Um, and I should also say that a big part of, uh, of, of what we, of our sort of philosophy of teaching is the whole hacker ethic that you shouldn't be following just our instructions and ending up with something that looks exactly like whatever's on the cover of the box. The idea is that once you understand the basics, you ought to be able to deviate from it, whether you assemble the parts in a different way, add some of your own parts, leave out some of our parts, substitute different parts, like the example I gave earlier about using a, a bigger motor instead of the motor we have. It's all different ways to sort of expand the, the, um, the concepts of the engineering principles um, into a much broader space. One of the ways that we got involved in this, in teaching in general and in the Maker Faire in particular, is uh, Dale asked us to put together a, a class. Actually, it started off as being electronics for artists and it very rapidly changed into something very different. Um, but what it had been over the past four years is an opportunity for people to take apart discarded electronics, um, to learn about what was inside, how actually things are put together, how to disassemble them, and how to identify various components that are inside, uh, whether it's things like motors and LEDs that can be reused, or stuff that just looks cool, like colored cable looks really cool, whether or not you use it as wire. Um, and then out of that grew, well, now that you have these LEDs, what can you do with them? How do you attach them to a battery? What are the considerations? If you're making a robot with a motor, uh, what kind of issues are there about gearing and how fast it can go and how much weight it can carry? Uh, and that kind of grew into a whole series of classes, um, which over the four years that we've been doing Maker Faire has developed into more and more advanced projects at Maker Faire and led rise to our business, Teach Me to Make. Um, this year at Maker Faire, we're focusing less on using salvage, um, salvaged electronics, and we're introducing a lot more um, project-based um, um, projects. So the idea is that we will have more of the supplies that we talked about earlier, the clothespins, the LEDs, the popsicle sticks, um, combined with things that come out of salvaged equipment, and turning that into, into various art and technology pieces. 
So for instance, we did a project at um, a school an, uh, a number of months ago where each kid built a marble maze. So each kid was given a one cubic foot of space and told the marble comes in at one corner, has to leave at the opposite corner, and in between they can do whatever they want. So there wasn't really any high tech there, but there were certainly basic scientific principles, and we very much encouraged the artistic elements. How does it look? How, what, what are the sketches of your design before you start building, and how are you going to express that given the materials that we have on hand? Um, and then we took those 30-odd pieces that each kid had made, and we wanted to assemble it into a maze that would go from start to finish. We very quickly realized that 30 kids doing one cubic foot is way too big for a classroom, so we were kind of stuck there for a while until the idea of um, bringing it to Maker Faire came up. So that is one of the centerpieces in our workshop this year, is this giant marble maze that the kids came in today and built. Um, it's built around a, a couple of two by fours that stand about six feet tall. Um, and it sort of looks like a quadruple helix of um, um, these, these uh, spirals of various components of the maze. And the marble goes in at one corner and comes out at the other corner. And the kids were just thrilled to bits to be able to bring it to make a fair, to finish their work here, and also to show other kids who were visiting here what they had done, how they had done it, and uh, what kind of difficulties they, they discovered along the way, how they learned to get, overcome those difficulties. It was a great experience. And now everybody can, can add to that thing, whether it's kids or adults or anybody visiting. I'm an, I'm an educator, so I teach elementary school. I'm really, environmental education is really important to me, as with everything else in education, and also educating people about how to be more sustainable with water use, so adults and you know, young people, anyone. Um, that is another the passion of mine. So I teach, you know, during the day and then on the weekends and at Maker's Fair. I grew up in more in Northern California, and we our drinking water came from a spring, and it went into a septic system. So all the water stayed on the property. And if a neighbor, we were as a neighbor, a community scale water system, and if a neighbor wasted water, we would have no water. So it was really clear like where our water came from and where it went to, and that we had limitations. And then moving to the city, it was this unlimited supply. Um, you know, no consciousness of where our water comes from, where it goes, and how that impacts other people and other living things along the way. And so for, after living here for five years and not even questioning where my water came from, I had this moment of like shock and horror, like, I have no idea where is this coming from? And that was kind of the awakening moment. Greywater Gorillas, we're primarily an education-based group, and we show people, teach people how they can be more sustainable with water, and we do hands-on workshops. So we you know, in, in houses where we're actually installing a real system, have people come and learn about gray water, as well as rainwater and composting toilets. And so we want to give people the, you know, the book knowledge as well as the practical hands-on skills and really focus on the simple, low-tech, low-cost systems. Gray water is water from your sinks, showers, and washing machines. It, you have to use ecological products so the water will be safe for your plants, and you can reuse that directly out to your landscape. The legalities of gray water really varies across the country. Um, arid states have a lot more friendly gray water codes. California has a very restrictive code, but that's, it's being rewritten right now. And so the next uh, code that's coming out is going to be a lot more friendly to gray water. We're becoming a nonprofit, so we're going to be working with a, a group that does international clean water work. So we really want to connect the U.S., you know, the local with the international, because having clean water is every, important to everyone. And we're very privileged in the United States to have it coming to our tap. So here we need to learn how to take care of it. In other places, people need access to clean water. So you want to really bridge the you know, global access to clean, safe water. Gray water is a really great way to just reconnect to your water cycle. And it's just you know, better for everything. Learn about healthy products so it's healthier for you and your, your plants and gardens. And also you can grow you know, fruit trees and really amazing plants reusing your water. So you're saving money, you're saving water. It's good for the environment. It's good for you. It's good for everybody. My passion is making people feel empowered with technology, to feel like they can actually use it to do what they want to do, rather than feeling like they have to fear it or that it's going to run over them. The biggest thing for me really is, is that point about feeling empowered as opposed to fear. Um, I'm constantly amazed at how much fear destroys things, and so many people will hide fear about technology, fear of systems behind boredom, behind apathy, and so forth. But it's really just feeling like they're inadequate, they don't have a part of it. And I think that's the number one thing you've got to get over. Once you get over that, everything changes. I've been teaching physical computing for several years, and the challenge in teaching people who are not technical about technical things, about microcontrollers and sensors and so forth, is that 
they don't have the background that the people who make the tools to do it assume they have. In other words, when engineers build things, they assume you know about engineering. Well, you don't. So what my partners and I decided to do uh, was basically to make a tool that was designed for our students who were artists and designers and you know, sociologists, people who had never done any of this before. Um, so the tool that we made is, is to teach people how to do that very simply. And we also wanted to make it an open source tool to show people that it was viable to make open source hardware. And so that's what we made and that's what we're selling now as well as uh, teaching with it. Well, the next things that I'm looking into uh, are twofold. One, I've always had a passion for monkeys, and I'm now working with a primatologist on developing sensor systems for tracking the social relationships between monkeys and the Amazon. So that's just the pure fun research project. The other thing that I'm working on is uh, I'm building an area of sustainable technology development at I ITP. Um, we spend a lot of time making things, and we also make a huge mess. And the one thing I want to try and get across to students from the very beginning is, number one, be empowered by technology, and number two, recognize that in doing it, you have an impact on the earth, and you might as well figure out how to reduce that while you go. Escape from Berkeley is an alternative fuel race, but our twist on it is we only allow you to start the race with one gallon of your alternative fuel, or gallon equivalent. Um, say, for instance, if you have an electric vehicle, we, you're, you would start with depleted batteries. Um, the idea is that from then on you have to scavenge, borrow, beg, cajole, do a little dance for your fuel along the way. Um, and the idea behind that is we want people to think that there's more power out there than they, than they think there to be. Like that, that wood on the side of the road that's just going to sit there is actually fuel. Or that veggie oil that that restaurant used and has to pay to dispose of is really fuel. And so this is a way for us to have a fun event, but also show the local communities we go through, the lo local kind of community at all, that these ideas and these things are possible. For me, the energy system right now is centralized, it's inaccessible, you can't touch it, you can't understand it. It's this sort of vaporous thing that you plug your <laughs> your clock into the wall and it just goes on. But other than that, you don't know what's happening behind it. So for me, my passion is about removing that veil and letting people walk in, um, democratizing it, making it more accessible. Escape from Berkeley came from all the enthusiasts at the shipyard, All Power Labs, Skunk Works. Essentially, we were an art space that started in Berkeley. Um, by a bunch of tinkerers, hackers, scientists, <laughs> engineers. Um, basically, people had passion about exploring obtainium, exploring ideas, exploring technology and how they work together. Um, and then Berkeley turned our power off. And so we all had to become power engineers. Um, and then through that, we found another medium we wanted to work with, which was energy. <laughs> um, and this is, Escape from Berkeley was a natural um, coalescence of ideas, like of um, working and playing with energy, but also creating an event and a context for others to interact with it. You know, one fantasy that'll probably come true pretty soon is I want to do a series of things called power trips, which are essentially little um, uh, events for people to come and explore local power places. So we're going, I'm right now arranging um, a tour of East Bay Muds, um, uh, Oakland Station. Um, they're doing some really interesting, not only methane capturing, but also um, they're doing some interesting um, water reclamation work. And I just, I like that idea of kind of playing with the word power trip, um, but using that as a way for people to come in and understand something. So just creating another context for play and exploration. My passion is uh, electronics and art. Um, so I really, you know, I uh, started out doing electronics a long time ago, um, just in a cubicle in, in an office somewhere, buried away. Um, and uh, sort of in my hobby spare time, I'd be in my garage just hacking on stuff. And then I found, you know, ultimately I sort of built the first one of these maybe four years ago 
just as a one-off art project, and I would ride it around Oakland, I'd ride around San Francisco, and people loved it. Um, and they loved it so much that you know, I'd be at a, at a stop sign, and people would run up to me and they'd say, where can I buy that? Where can I buy that? Uh, and ultimately, that convinced me that maybe I should try and uh, sell it. Um, so for about a year and a half, we've been working on what we turned into the, the product version that we sell now. Um, and so we're really happy because we've been able to find a product that's for bicycles, and it's electronic, so it's fun for me to make it. Digital art, it's also a lot of fun. And uh, so it keeps people visible, safe on their bikes, and also gives them a lot of fun while they're out there. One of the critical moments for me when we were, when I first was just riding around with, with one of these was, I, I was riding down in West Oakland, um, and I was sort of coming up to a stop sign, and uh, right next to me pulled up this guy in a, a lime green, what they call over there, a scraper car, uh, 1978 Buick with the you know huge wheels and he rolled down his window and smoke poured out and he said nice ride man but we're very involved with the bike community supporting them um, a big part of that is sort of making it so that people can make cool you know have fun on their bikes and have cool bikes um, so we're introducing new products that let people customize their bikes in more fascinating ways my passion is entrepreneurship I love risk-taking I love business um, and I also, I have scenes out there, but I also love to mix in a little marine conservation. Uh, I definitely consider myself an environmentalist. About 20 years ago, the Monterey Bay Aquarium put together the first jellyfish exhibit, and it was a huge success. People just went gaga over it. And, um, you know, within a decade, every aquarium across the U.S. had opened up a jellyfish exhibit, and, you know, people just love them. So I saw that, and then I assumed, you know, you must be able to have a jellyfish as a pet, but no one was really doing it, no company was offering that. And I looked at the barriers, why, why no one had done that, what had kept the comp competition out. And I was like, all right, I can break down that barrier, I can break down that one, and I started tackling them and, uh, and just formed a business out of that. When I was laid off from my job at a biotech company in May of 2008, and then, um, then I was like, all right, this is, you know, I looked around for work for a month, but it just wasn't happening. So I was like, this is the time, this has got to be it. Um, so I just kind of launched into it and, um, you know, started working my butt off and uh, making progress. Um, so now today, you know, I've gotten the business off the ground. Um, I've been getting a lot of publicity, so that's, that's been helping a lot. Um, and the desktop tank really um, behind me is what I really wanted to do from the beginning. Um, so I started doing these high-end custom aquariums, um, which is great, you know, it brought in some income, it got me some experience, but from the very beginning what I really wanted to be able to offer was an affordable desktop tank that anyone could have. And I just started selling that about a month ago. I started my company Jellyfish Art with the intention of being able to supply everything. So I supply the tanks, the live jellies, the food, the customer support, and then also these large custom installations. Um, so I really, I mean, I had no choice. I had to do it all. There, there is no jellyfish supply. There's no jellyfish food supply. So I had to do it all. One of the most rewarding things I've ever done was uh, donating a jellyfish tank to um, to a little five-year-old who was part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I had uh, I just started out, and I read about him in the paper because. Um, he had, when he was going through chemotherapy, he would, his mom would just wheel him in front of the jellyfish tanks every day when he couldn't walk, and he would just sit there for hours and stare at him. And uh, so when the Make-A-Wish Make Foundation found him, they were like, what do you want? And he was like, I want jellyfish. So they were like, I wasn't around yet. And uh, so they ended up sending him to the Bahamas where they have a big exhibit. Um, so I ended up reading about it later. So I was like, I gotta get this kid a jellyfish tank. I mean, in the whole world, he's probably the biggest fan of jellyfish. So I, I went up there and I donated a tank to him, a small tank, and this kid was amazing. I mean, he knew more than I did about jellyfish. He, his birthday was jellyfish themed, so everyone had to dress as a jellyfish if they wanted to eat the jellyfish cake. Um, he was obsessed. I had never seen anything like it. Um, so, I mean, just giving him a jellyfish tank was amazing. Just, you know, seeing his eyes light up. And, uh, and you know, he, he actually recovered and he's doing great. And, um, you know, it's was, it was fantastic. I've kind of been, gotten a lot of attention for starting a business during the recession. And, you know, I got, like when I started the business a lot, you know, half the people would say, oh, you're selling luxury items. You're so lucky. Rich people don't care during the recession. You're going to do fine. The other half say, oh, God, you're selling luxury items in a recession. You're screwed. No one's going to buy that. So no one really knows what the hell is going on during a recession. It's a very chaotic time, which is perfect for starting a company. I mean, 
starting a company is extremely chaotic, and to do it in a chaotic environment is just, I mean, it gives you even more fodder. And, you know, it's a great, there are certain advantages. I mean, it's a great time to pick up great talent. Um, you know, labor is cheap, lots of things are cheap. Um, you can kind of fly under the radar on a lot of things. So for anyone who, you know, is thinking about starting a business, this is just as good a time as any. Um, you know, being young is a great time. You have no responsibility. Um, so I would really encourage anyone to do it. I think business doesn't always understand what enthusiasm is. We talk in a lip service way about passion and we want people to be really engaged. But it often is a matter of people following their own direction, not, not giving them direction. So when I look at the makerspace, what's wonderful there is nobody's made them do anything. They've decided to do it themselves. And I think there's a lot of a, there's a business opportunity in working with that. That's a flow if you think of it. And how do you get in that flow? How do you discover it, first of all? You can think of this analogy. Uh, makers are like innovation in the wild. It's like going into the jungle and looking for a new species. You don't know what you're going to find there, but you have to go there. We domesticate innovation. We put it in a lab and we expect creative ideas to come out of it, either by hiring the best and the brightest or saying, go build this thing that we need desperately. Whereas I think the other idea here is it already exists. You just haven't found it yet. So how could you get more of your company exploring out in the wild, looking for people and figuring out how do I bring them in? How do I develop that? Because they need help too. Makers aren't going to do soup to nuts. They don't have distribution. They don't have manufacturing. They have ideas and they have ways of proving those ideas are real interesting. So I think there's a real nice potential connection here in tapping. Or it's, it's very similar to what we call open source. It's very similar to what the web has been. Is, you know, these ideas spring up and they're, they're there. How do you go look for them? Uh, rather than some of the preconceived notions of I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force this through my company or force this through a process. Thanks for watching this episode of Business with Passion. If you'd like more information about the makers at the Maker Fair, other shows, or perhaps to be a guest on a future show, go online to tv.manygoodideas.com.